So thank you once again, uh, Robert, uh, sir, for accepting your, our invitation and uh, agreeing to deliver the talk on a very important topic, the serious crime investigation. Thank you, uh, Ranjit. Um... Yeah, so here I like to give the uh, brief introduction about esteemed speaker, Bob. Uh, we, he, uh, like we call him a Bob also. He's a very uh, kind person. So Dr. Robert Green is a university leader in University of Kent. Bob is currently uh, holding the forensic science and the director of student engagement within the School of Physical Science at the University of Kent, UK, as well as teaching extensively on the forensic science program within the school. Prior to joining the university, he worked within the research and service development at the forensic science service and led to leading the science and technology unit within the police standard unit at the UK Home Office. Most notably, he was uh, responsible for initiating the Home Office work on performance improvement using computer simulation to ensure the most effective business processes are adopted across the forensic science service <clears throat> in the UK. Robert is a uh, well-known and developing and leading the national program of the cold case rape investigation operation advance as well as being a national and international speaker on the development of the dna and other biometric databases throughout his career throughout his career he has managed a number of national and international projects namely cctv street crime and homicide reduction initiative in the order to ensure the most effective use of technology, both to combat crime. He was made an OBE in the Queen and birthday on a list of 2008 for his service to forensic science. Over 34 years, he has led a large number of consultancies, both in the UK and abroad. Dealing with science technology and how we maximize our business processes to get the best from the investment in the science. He is a keynote speaker in 2021, International Association of Scientists and Researchers on the Forensic Application of DNA. So thank you so much, uh, sir, for accepting our invitation. I will hand over the session to you. Thank you. So good, more, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's certainly just about sort of just gone morning um, in, in the UK. This is a presentation uh, you can see from my, my previous employment. I'm, uh, I retired from the Home Office uh, a good few years ago now and went into academia. Um, but it, it is a way of, of, sort of sharing some of these experiences. And I, I want to tell you in, in a very honest and in a very truthful uh, way, um, actually how just this idea came to, to fruition. But before I do that, can I just start by saying a massive thank you to um, to, to, to Ranjit um, and to everyone who's uh, participated in a, uh, this spectacular um, successes this year. Uh, certainly in academia, when we moved into this current pandemic situation, we were all very worried about you know what would uh, what would happen, how would we continue to uh, to deliver, and so forth and so on. And it's through the uh, the sterling efforts of people like like yourselves. Uh, that we've managed to to keep going. So before we start, a, a massive well done to to everyone. So uh, give everyone, give yourselves a uh, a cheer. Um, so this is a, a talk on on one of the the, the topics that um, uh, that we, we pushed forward. When, whilst, whilst I was at the Home Office, um, we had a number of work streams. One was, as Ranjit said, there it was about uh, making sure that we get the the most out of forensic science. Uh, because I often have thought over the years um, that we, we can very often, the, the easy thing to do is to get the science to work. Um, that's often the, the easy part of the equation. Um, the hard part is really getting people, getting the business processes working correctly, getting people to understand you know, how to submit. Um, and and it, above all, certainly my, my time at the Home Office proved that one of the benefits of forensic science is that it's so very tangible. Um, and we can very easily demonstrate the value of what you guys do now. Um, so if we don't do that, of course, we don't get the ministerial buy-in. Uh, but it's very, very easy, uh, in my experience, to show the value of, of forensic science. So um, this is just one example of that. It was um, a story that begins um, 
Sounds like a little bit of a, 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 a novel story, this is it, but it, it is a story that starts off um, in um, early, um, well, a good few years ago now in a pub in, in, in London, of, of all places. And I'd come from the Forensic Science Service um, and, of course, still had friends um, in the, the FSS, as it was referred to, uh, although I'd gone initially on secondment into the, the Home Office to, to lead this this police standards unit team uh, looking at science. Um, and the, 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 the story as we were standing at the, the bar um, was around cases that were literally just in a backlog. Uh, and it went something along the lines of, uh, Bob, we've got um, a number of freezers at, uh, I think the laboratory was at Weatherby Laboratory up in the, the north of England. Uh, and we don't know what to do with them. Um, we've these old rape cases. Um, we've written to the police services themselves to um, to see if they if they want us to um, to, to upgrade a sample. And I'll, I'll talk to you more about the science in a moment. Um, but um, we've had no response. Uh, and the, the fridges, the freezers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the, the, the storage in these, um, and we really don't know what to do. And, and so the purpose of tomorrow's meeting, uh, they were coming for a meeting with, with me in the Home Office. The purpose of this meeting is to say, officially, um, from the government's point of view, uh, can we destroy these samples? Um, and we, we reflected um, and... I immediately, I thought, no, we, we absolutely can't destroy these samples. This would be um, unheard of. You know, the, these poor victims have actually gone through uh, enough trauma in, in their life. Um, they've then been, been subjected to, uh, you know, a, a very unpleasant um, examination, medical examination, forensic examination. And therefore, to just to destroy these, it would be, in my opinion, not have been, uh, been the right thing to do in any event. And so, um, although we'd, um, we, we'd been drinking in this bar, um, I said, no, we, we, we can't do that. But what we, what we will do, um, let's have the meeting tomorrow and let's see if we can put together a business case. Let's see if we can, to write, if we can write some, uh, uh, a plan to actually say, you know, how can we, uh, how can we, we take these things forward? So this was around about the, the early part uh, of the year, um, coming up toward the, the end at which uh, finances in many public bodies have to be um, cleared by. Um, so I said, well, if, if we work quickly, how about we can actually get the money out of this year's budget um, and let's just do these samples. And I'm gonna explain to you what these, uh, the, these cases were, what, what we started with. Uh, and, and how that hopefully um, you'll sort of realise that this was perhaps rather a, a novel way of, of taking this forward. So that's the background um, of being in this pub. Um, I then went to bed uh, and I don't know if um, any of you have experienced this, but you, you have some ideas when you, at night when you're drinking and you're talking to others. Uh, and sometimes by the time you get up the following morning, uh, the idea is gone or you think, well, actually, that wasn't so good an idea anyway. But this, this idea seemed a much, much better idea uh, the, fo the following morning. Um, and I woke up and thought, you know, we, we can do this. Um, we can, we can uh, resurrect these, these cases. Now, remember that these were just, they were serious crime cases. They were all what we refer to as stranger rapes. Um, so rapes that had um, been uh, perpetrated by people who were not known to the, uh, to the victim. And this really is against a backdrop um, in our country of, you know, rape is a, a significant crime. Um, and what I read of the, um, the international press, I, I know that in a number of countries, it's equally and, and sometimes perhaps if not more of an issue. Um, but there's a lot of, of rape and a lot of sexual offending in, in our country. Um, and it always strikes me as odd that given the, the massive investment we had in, in DNA, um, you know, a, a very, very powerful tool for what we refer to as crimes against the person. Um, what we know, why, why are we not better at this? Why, why do we not detect more of these, these um, offences? Um, so there's, there's a lot of them. Um, they are very costly to, to investigate. Um, there's, generally speaking, a poor return on that investment. Um, so um, 
I think I'm right in saying that the the, the detection rate, the clear up rate for, uh, for for these crimes, um, is a very very low percentage. I was going to say five percent, but it's I'm not entirely sure, but it's it's a very low percentage. So given that we've we've had all this this investment, why are we not better at doing this? Um, it, it's, they're very costly to investigate, as I said. Um, 15% uh, of rapes are reported, uh, and the conviction rate is 5.3%. I wasn't looking at the slide, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Um, so 5.3 of cases. Uh, so out of every 100, um, only five get solved. Um, and you can imagine that the politicians were saying, well, you know, we've just pumped 280 million pounds into DNA expansion. Why is it that you guys are not better at doing this? Um, so, um, it, it's always struck me that, you know, if you were to place these offences on a, a continuum of, of seriousness, but at the top, of course, we'd have terrorism offences, um, then we'd have, I guess, we'd have homicides. Um, and for, for me, that, that next, and I'm not sure you can differentiate in this way, but, but that, that next sort of level down must be, um, you know, crimes against, um, you know, sexual crimes, violent crimes against women, and as we found out with Operation Advance, this program that, uh, uh, that some of these offences do take uh, place against men also. Um, so what could we do? Um, so we initiated this project um, in 2004. Um, it was shortly after my, uh, my drink in the pub. Um, and there's an invitation to everyone in the, in, in the room um, that if you ever come to London, um, we'll go back to this pub um, and I can tell you where, where this plot to this, this idea was, was hatched. Um, and why would we want to do this? Um, well, very often the, my, my students nowadays ask me, you know, who invented DNA? Who is it that invented this? Who, who did that? Well, it, 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 there's been a, a, a slower, um, a, a gradual buildup um, of techniques um, in around forensic DNA, at least over the years, no one really invented. Um, we, we can actually go back way, way uh, to actually some of the, the early ideas. Um, and of course, our first case, the, the Colin Pitchfork case in, in, in the UK, um, was that very first case where DNA, forensic DNA, was used in, in a murder investigation. But no one person um, invented it. Um, and there, there's been a, a gradual buildup of techniques. Um, and the take home message with that is that some of those early techniques um, were not compatible with the database as it currently stood. So my friend who we were standing in the pub with um, was saying to me, we need to upgrade the sample. Um, we need to do some further rework on the, 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 the extract, um, which was literally just sitting by the caseload um, in these freezers. Um, but of course, um, we needed the, the police service to, to say yes to that. Um, in our country also, the police service would need to, uh, to, to pay for that also. So there would be a cost. So um, what, my, what, what we were finding was that, uh, you know, that the, by that time, the, the police were saying, look, you know, we, we have enough cases, we have enough current cases. Why should we look back at these old cases? What's in this for us? You know, when we've got millions of cases, you know, day to day, um, why should we look back at these cases? And what I hope to do today is to give you an indication of actually why you should look, look back uh, as well as forward. Um, so we wrote the, the, the project, um, we got the, the money. Um, it was very bold, I suppose, looking back on it now. Um, we decided, um, I suppose I decided that, that we would just do this. Um, and we spoke with the, the police service. We have, we have 43 police services in the, the UK, um, and we, we told them that this is what we were going to do. So we got these samples out of the freezer. Um, we've provided the finances to, to pay the, the FSS to try to do the, the science rework. Um, and then we, uh, we, we sat back um, and we didn't sit back for more than uh, a, a few days. Uh, before these uh, cases started to match. So you know, is this the first cold case investigation uh, in the world? No, it's not. Um, is it the first cold case investigation where this has been, actually been led by a, a central body? Um, the answer, I think, it is yes. 
So the idea would be to, to make these um, older DNA samples um, compatible with the databases it stood at the time. Um, and we would then we'd load the sample to the database and see what, what came out. So just going back to my slide there, um, you can see that there are three ways in which you can conduct these cold case uh, reviews. Um, and I'm hopefully going to show you the, the importance of, of doing this uh, when we, we look at some of the offending patterns of these, these people. Um, how are cold cases resurrected? Um, there are three ways in my experience how they're, they're resurrected. One is from the victim um, and the, the victim's family um, who are, you know, show a resilience really not to let these cases die, um, you know, to, to drop off the radar. Um, you know, that they want justice for their victims, for their, their family members. Um, they're also victims themselves who, who will continue to push for this. Um, but of course, those, um, you know, memory fades, people, you know, people's um, will dies off over the time. Um, and so that, in our experience, gets, gets less, uh, gets smaller and smaller. So similarly, policing, um, there, there are, you know, it can be, they, they oft, are often um, resurrected by dogged uh, police detectives, people who literally won't let the case rest. You know, they've carried these cases around with them for, you know, sometimes 20 odd years. Um, and that they have that determination to, to continue to, to push ahead with this. Um, but of course, you know, there's some real misconceptions amongst certainly some of the, the police officers I spoke to in the, uh, those early days uh, about saying to me, well, Bob, what's, you know, what, what, why are we doing all this? Why are we just opening up all these old, old wounds? Um, you know, the, the victims have moved on with their lives. Um, you know, that they don't really want to... Uh, to have this all raked up again, they don't want it dragging up um, all over again, um, and that was uh, that was a sentiment that was was um, put forward. I'll tell you now, absolutely categorically, that that was not our experience. Um, these people, these people who have been offended against in this way, um, they do want to see justice. They haven't forgot about it, for forgotten about it. Um, they. Um, want their, we, we call it their day in court. Um, and the interesting thing is if we, if we don't do anything at that point in time, uh, I hope to show you what continues to happen where these offenders uh, think, well, I've got away with this once, uh, I'll do it again and again and again. So those are the three ways. And of course, whilst these uh, first few uh, diminish over time, um, forensic science just gets better and better and better, doesn't it? The, the, the things that you guys do, not, not me anymore, um, but the things that you do daily in, in the laboratory um, are, are just better this year than they were last year. Um, you know, let's just look at some of the, the advances over the, uh, the years, you know, more sensitive DNA. Um, our DNA samples now are turned around standard uh, in around five days. So from a, a crime sample going into a laboratory, um, five days we've got of course we've got rapid hit technology that can produce a dna sample a dna profile in in around 90 minutes uh we've got the things um, that are happening with genetic genealogy um we spearheaded some work with uh, familial dna uh, and again i'm, I'm going to get some books off my, my bookshelf in a moment to, to show you some of the, the uh, writing that we did along the way so those two um victim and police perspectives diminish over time uh, whereas forensic science expands, and, and that is to everyone's credit. Everyone who happens to actually see now in the audience, uh, that's to, to your credit. Um, so it, this was a, a sort of continuum of, of where we started, um, and some of the, the old uh, MLP um, profiles were around that, that period where, where Colin Pitchfork was, um, was our first murderer convicted with, the, with DNA. It was around that time. Um, so MLPs we had in 87, uh, in 1990 we had uh, single locus probes, um, we then had a, a multiplex called Quad, uh, which actually never, uh, never took hold, it was actually never used at the time when the database was launched. launched. Um, we actually went through with, uh, we, we started with this SGM, this second generation multiplex, which was a uh, um, by my recollection, was, was a six-plex. 
system. Uh, we then very quickly went to um, a, a template uh, because of the we needed more discriminating power very early on in the database uh, evolution. And so the period that we looked at um, was this um, this SLP period. Um, so when we moved from MLPs to to SLPs, the Forensic Science Service had. Uh, built it themselves a little SLP database, if you will, um, just to actually manage the, the, the sort of throughput of these, these cases. So we had a period um, 89 to about 95. That doesn't mean to say that that's really where cold case investigation always has to remain. It, it doesn't, uh, but that's where we started. Um, and of course, now we've got we've got new, um, more advanced multiplexes, DNA 17 in our country. I know that some countries have a, a even a more discriminating multiplex that, than we do. So that's that's where we started. Um, and these were, if you, if you look at the um, the 89 to 95, that was just a sample of what was in the freezers at um, in various laboratories. Um, so we started with. Uh, a number of, of these, and we started Operation Advance, as you can see there, um, sometime afterwards. So where did we start? We started with uh, 215 cases. Just hold the thought a moment, because these were 213 ca 215 cases, pardon me, um, where, um, you know, uh, the, the notion was, you know, we, we've done about as much as we can with, with these. Um, uh, and therefore we should just delete them from our files. We should just uh, essentially forget about them. Um, the number 148 will forever be etched on, on my mind because it was that number that we actually initially identified. Um, we started with, um, um, with 148. You might say, well, why did you drop um, the um, you know, the 67 cases, um, why did you not go ahead with all of the 215? Well, we knew, of course, that, that um, there were, there were four re three reasons. One was the case had been detected, it had been cleared up. Um, the other case was uh, uh, cases were where we had no remaining exhibits. Um, and one, one case I recall that was the level of DNA found on the, the samples was of such a, a low level, uh, bearing in mind in 2004, uh, that it was decided that we would wait for, for more sensitive techniques. And of course, nowadays, we, we, we've got those. Um, so that's where we, we started. There's a, um, there's a schematic um, there to, to show us what happens with, with these. So we, we starting at the top, we had the 215. Um, so what happened? What happened in terms of, I suppose, the science first? 60 gave us a full profile. Uh, straight away. Um, 19 gave us a, a partial profile. Um, 33 were, uh, were mixtures. Uh, and of course, I, I suspect that nowadays, you know, with the, the lower levels of DNA that we're starting we, with, uh, we would probably have seen more, uh, more, more partials uh, and more mixtures. So that next level, that next line down is, is the science. Um, and the next line down then is, is what happens to them um, on the database. So this is your work at the, the lab guys, the next line down, um, and the, um, you, can, you, can, you can follow the progress through of these and, and actually what happened to them. Um, so 34, 16% gave a scene to a single name, um, five gave a scene to multiple names, um, there are a number that give a scene-to-scene -scene match, so same person, uh, but we don't actually know who it is yet on, on the database. Um, not searched, a negative um, search when it was searched on the database. And again, that's not, you know, not, it's not all over if you have a negative search. Because the, one of the benefits of doing this is that by going back through your, your archives in this way, you actually make all of these samples, all of these SLP, these early samples that were, remember, were not compatible with the database as it currently stood. Um, we were then able to, uh, to make them out. We are often referred to it as, as match fit. Uh, it, made that, it meant that every time then a, a buckle scrape, uh, you know, a reference sample, uh, a sample from a, a, a suspect uh, for, for another crime is loaded to the database, uh, it would match against these historic crimes. So 
regardless of this, there's real benefits of doing this um, um, for, for, for many reasons. So what happens after that? Um, and again, I suspect that our experiences with the, the conviction rates and the, the sentencing rates will be different to, to, to yours um, in various countries. I know that uh, certainly in, in India, the, 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 the penalties for these types of crimes are, are, are much, perhaps are much more severe than they would be in, in, the, in the UK. Uh, but all of these, as I said, were, were not acquaintance rapes. Um, they were not that makes any difference at all, but they, they were people who'd been accosted by, by these strangers um, and they needed, I felt that they needed some, some closure, they needed something to be done with these, these crimes. So this really refers now just to that, that first block. Um, so we thought, well, God, what, what do we do now? What, what can we do? Um, we'd got these, these matches, um, around about a third of these matches, of the 148 um, matched uh, straight away. Some of these cases matched subsequently um, because we'd actually made the samples suitable to, to be loaded, the crime, these historic cases suitable to be loaded to the, the crime sample database. Um, and, and one example of, of that, took, let, me, let me give you two examples where we, uh, we started to get benefits after the event. One was um, it's not permitted on, on our railway stations nowadays to smoke uh, in public places. Um, one case in particular was a guy who'd been asked to be stopped smoking by a police officer. Uh, he um, refused and eventually got arrested. He was arrested, a buckle scrape was taken, um, and he subsequently matched um, one of these cases um, later on. Um, well, straight away, one of the, the historic cases, pardon me. Another case was a guy who was uh, urinating in the street. Um, he was uh, around about Christmas time, he got drunk, um, he was urinating in the street um, and was arrested, mouth swabbed, um, and again matched against these, um, the, the, some of the, one, one of these historic cases. So did you all see really the benefit of the, the match straight away uh, and the benefit of, of this you know, in, in the years ahead? So. Um, what were the, these early convictions? We, we ran Operation Advance in, in around four phases. Um, so this was the first phase. We then uh, ran some further phases again in, uh, uh, for, for as, as we were digging out more of these samples, we had a similar type of uh, um, operation. Um, so let me just move, if I can, um, I'm not entirely sure if you can see me as well as the screen, but if you can, um, I hope you can. Um, we published some, some guidance along the way. Uh, um, please guys, if you want any of this guidance, I can make it available to, uh, to, to Dr. Ranjit. Um, the first was the good practice guide um, on you looking at using science and using investigations uh, to resurrect these cases. You'll see that within there's flowcharts um, to uh, uh, to show, show people how to do it. We then said, well, what, what, what happens if we don't get a match? Um, we'd been experimenting with familial DNA searching um, for some time. Uh, and that was our guidance uh, on how to do a familial search. Um, so this really predated uh, the genetic genealogy topics that we we're looking at now. Uh, but, but that was certainly our, uh, um, our guidance on that. Uh, and a number of other um, guidance documents on uh, investigating sexual offences. Of course, it's, in a sense, it's easy to do the science. Um, it's harder to actually get these types of ideas embedded into you know, police officers' minds, getting them embedded into uh, the, the judicia judiciary. Um, and uh, it's not just as, as simple as the, the science. So one of the things, I suppose, the, one of the, the hopefully the, the smart things I did was to, uh, to employ a, uh, re a re retired police officer um, who was, he had worked for the unit, uh, worked for our uh, team before, um, and he was just about to retire. Um, and I said to him, well, what I'd like you to do uh, is to, track all of these cases you know i don't want to end just with the the, the fact that this was a 
you know, a detection. It was a, you know, a, a good DNA match. I want you to tell me, uh, I want you to follow these cases all the way through to court. Um, and all of these were, 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 were those types of, uh, of instance. These, again, these are just off that, that first batch. Um, we had, uh, yeah, we, we had a number of conferences um, where we would often invite one of the victims. They were very, very brave victims to come and speak about their experiences and how they, they, they'd been treated by the, uh, the, the service, how they'd been treated by the, um, the whole criminal justice process. Um, and then at the back of the, the auditorium um, were all of the, the, the colleagues from the Forensic Science Service handing the dossier of cases to the, the, the individual police service. Now you can see that one of these is that it's a, a Kent Police uh, and Sussex Police. Um, and interestingly, um, this guy was committing offences on uh, university campuses. Uh, he was a lot younger in those days. Um, and what he would do, he would pass himself off as a, a fresher, freshman. Um, and um, he would, one of the cases in, in Kent, I, I know he hid under the bed. Um, uh, it was an American national uh, victim. Uh, she'd come over, she'd traveled over from the US to start her first day at university. He'd hidden under the bed uh, and committed these uh, these offenses. Um, of course, samples were sent off, but those those early samples um, were not, um, you know, they weren't suitable to be loaded to the database as it stood. Um, he did the same with uh, another university in, um, I think in Brighton. Um, and it was Carl's job, my, my colleague's job, to actually track these all the way through to court because I wanted to know um, what these people uh, had done previously uh, and what they'd continued to do afterwards. So this is Paul, Paul Collins, and, and I'll go through these rather quickly because the, the story is much of a muchness with, with them all, but you'll see um, the difference uh, in, uh, in, a, in, in, in sentencing um, Life imprisonment, uh, this guy got, um, although I, you know, I, I suspect it won't necessarily mean life. Um, he will maybe do 15 years or something like that, but Paul Collins was given life imprisonment. Um, again, a recurring theme with, with these uh, people um, is that they, they weren't offenders who would often desist in their, their criminal careers. I, I don't know if we've got any criminology uh, scholars in the, uh, in the audience, um, but the, 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 some of the notions around criminal careers is that they, they will often sort of follow this Gaussian type curve, where if you look from left to right, the, the person um, who is going to start committing crime um, will, you know, will, will go on an, as an ascending pattern uh, up to the age of about 21, 22 years of age, and then come down the other side. That's not really the case with violent sexual offenders in, in our experience. I'm not saying criminologically theory otherwise it, it is but certainly that was not our experience that um that these people would follow that that pattern people who are have a a violent sexual um passion um will continue to offend in our experience into their uh, um the yeah, late late um career you know their advancing ages um and this was one of those cases this was a guy who was already serving uh a life sentence when this next one came uh, came around and some of these stories were were heartbreaking um to actually look at uh, uh, some of the backgrounds of these cases um this was stephen dunn i don't have a picture from for him um but he was he was sentenced to life imprisonment west yorkshire of course is the toward the north of the uh, the, the uk um this was a guy who was um, had been arrested um, as part of a an online child pornography uh, sting where people were uh, were downloading child pornography um, and I think rather stupidly were, were um, they were getting caught by by, by various means I suppose uh, but this was a guy Kirby uh, in in my county where I live at the moment. Um, was um, convicted of one rape, two false imprisonments in 1999. He ambushed a courting couple with, with a shotgun um, and uh, was arrested. And again, because we'd made these, these crime samples, the advanced crime samples, um, they were possible to be loaded. He matched straight away. He got 13 years. 
So uh, again, all of these people, um, very, very unpleasant individuals, uh, individuals who continued to offend. Um, they, they didn't desist in their, their offending. You know, they didn't do, commit one offense uh, and then think, actually, you know, that, that's it. You know, I'm going clean for the rest of my life. Um, they continued to, uh, to commit these type of offenses. And Keen, as you can see, this guy here, um, he was a guy from, I believe, Manchester. He was Greater Manchester. Um, and yeah, he'd, um, that was, you can, you can read for yourselves what his sort of background was. A very, very unpleasant uh, man. And he got 12 years. So we, we were all a little bit uncertain about, you know, well, why do people, some people get, to get 12 years? Why do some people get life imprisonment? Um, this is an interesting one and, and one which, which sticks out in my mind, really. Um, and it sticks out because um, I had at the time a young researcher um, who worked with me, who was um, looking at the, the background of these cases. It, remember, for us, it wasn't just about the science. Uh, it was about trying to tell a story about the, the, the power of science. It was trying to bring offenders to justice, give closure to victims, but actually learn along the way. And this was two, uh, two individuals um, uh, in uh, Thames Valley, roundabout by uh, sort of Windsor, just on the outskirts of London, that, that area. Their two brothers, uh, Stephen and Lee Ainsby. I think Stephen is the guy on the, I think Lee is the guy on the left and Stephen is the guy on, on the right. Um, and th that's the, the, the brief details of their, their offence. Um, it was a 17 year old female victim who then bundled into a car uh, and drove her off into the countryside. Um, and going back to the story of my, my young researcher, I went over to her desk one day and she was sitting there with, you know, with tears rolling down her cheeks um, because she was actually reading the, the, the account of the victim uh, and what these two uh, people did to her on that night. How she thought that she was going to be murdered at the end of this ordeal. Um, how she thought to, you know, uh, both of these victims, both of these offenders um, committed the offence on, on her. She thought she was going to be murdered. She ran through some, some bramble hedges, some very sharp uh, thorn hedges um, to see a, a farmhouse in the distance. Uh, and that's how she got away. And again, remember, the, this, these were just cases. These were just little Eppendorf tubes for, uh, for, for those who know what those are, little DNA tubes that were, were sitting in a, in a uh, freezer in Weatherby, uh, in the Weatherby lab, um, and would not have ever um, matched against these uh, individuals. So Lee is on the left, who had some previous convictions, um, and he'd, um, of course, as soon as we, we upgraded the, the sample, as soon as we upgraded the sample from 1995, he matched straight away. Um, but we also got a, a mixed profile. This is one of those cases with a, with a mixture. Um, and the scientist was able to say, well, this is a, um, a very close fit to a family member. Um, really giving us the you know, more, more emphasis on, on this familial uh, type of uh, affair. Although this wasn't in the strictest sense, it, it wasn't a familial case. Uh, but it was, you know, that, that third uh, component in the, in the mixture was uh, looking like a very close relative of Lee um, uh, Ingsby. So brother on the left gave what's referred to in the UK as a no comment interview. He, he said nothing, you know, um, just refused to answer police questions. Um, but they did find out, they, they asked him um, if he had any brothers. Um, and he said he had um, Stephen. Uh, interestingly, Stephen was not, he, he had no previous convictions. Um, so it was, you know, he had a clean record at that time. Um, and of course, for this type of case we actually got you know we, we got two for the price of one I suppose uh, and both of those uh, people got about 10 years. Um, Jennings um, again just a very very um, distressing cases this was a guy who committed his offences against uh, uh, street workers um, again the, the, the take-home message we, we learned from that was you know these people, um, you know, they don't make frivolous complaints. You know, if if they say they've been offended against, then you can bet your life that they have been. Um, this was a guy who committed a an offence against a, a street worker, um, a, 
he committed these offences in a hotel room. Um, uh, he'd worn some form of contraceptive protection, um, but then wiped himself down on one of the towels in the, uh, um, in, in the, in the hotel room. Uh, and that's how he was, was caught. So again, lots and lots of learning um, along the way. He got eight years for, for whatever reason, I don't know. And again, just, just more of the, of, of the same. Um, this you can see, the, but all of these were, were very violent offenders. I think Russell was the guy who he actually broke the nose of the, the victim. He thumped her in the face and broke her nose. So a horrifically violent rape. Um, and again, just I'll re re keep repeating this, you know, just think that these were cases that were, you know, were sitting in a, in a freezer um, and were on the cusp of being um, destroyed. He got eight years. Um, again, um, one of our first cases with familial searching, um, where we said, well, this is not a, an, an immediate match, uh, but it does, Tahir Mahmood, um, does bear a striking resemblance to someone who is already on the database. So not too dissimilar to genetic genealogy nowadays, but um, can we go back to the, the brother of... Uh, so that's how Mahmood was, was, was caught. Uh, and he got seven years. Um, again, more, more and more of, of these similar types of, of cases. Um, 17 years of age, can you just even think of it? Um, another one in, in West Midlands. Um, and very often what we found was that these people, as I said before, they, they don't desist in their offending. You know, they, they continue, you know, they, they get almost a a passion for this type of offending uh, and go on to commit further and further offences. So this is a message for, for all of the, the scientific, all of the, the policing community. Um, we need to all work together to make this process all work and just work as quickly as we possibly can, because these people will continue to offend um, if we don't, if you guys don't take them um, out of the, the, the equation. So more and more, 14-year-old uh, victim, can, can you even imagine what that must be, be like? Um, and again, just more of, of the same, really. But a, a real difference in offending. So this was, the, the, this was our first conviction with Operation Advance. So my, my co-worker went along to the, uh, um, to the court, um, on, actually on the day of their, uh, their, their trial, um, and saw what was happening to these people. Um, he was our first one um, and we, he got three and a half years. So you can imagine that doing all of this, um, we were all a little bit disappointed that this guy, McMullen, uh, hadn't got more sentence than, uh, than he did. And, and I'm guessing that in, in India, guys, uh, and around the world, that would be, that would be not, not be the case. Again, these people are, are not specialists. Um, they will, you know, people who have this, you know, uh, this sort of sexual deviancy will um, will have a go at lots of things. They, they'll try their hand at lots of variations on this type of criminality. Um, some of the back records of these individuals, when we, when the police officers went through their, their records, um, for example, they, they found that they'd had previous offences for uh, peeping toms. I don't know if that translates very well, but people who will um, peep in through uh, through, through windows. Uh, and people who will, um, uh, you know, perhaps expose themselves, um, and this is one of those those cases. So, um, lots of, uh, of of different types of uh, offences, offenders that were brought um, to justice. We ran a number of um, other projects. Um, so each time we changed the multiplex, each time there were new opportunities. Uh, each time we identified that cases were sitting in freezers, we would do exactly the same again um, and learn from this. And again, learn some, some real, you know, some scientific innovations along the way. I remember one case where we, we thought we had no sample, we had no extract to, to start with. Um, and the scientists was able to actually go back through their archives um, and on this occasion, the, the undergarments had been taped, they'd been fibre taped for uh, extraneous fibres. I'm, I'm sure we've got people in the audience who, who will have done, perhaps have done this. Um, and then the, the tape is, we, we identify some target fibres um, and the, those are then taken off and placed on microscope slides. 
Um, and who would have thought it that when they actually looked back at these you know, fiber slides, uh, they'd also found sperm head also that had been pulled off uh, at, at the same time. So we, we learned an awful lot. Not only did we, we do some, some great stuff, I think, for, for society, but we, we learned along the way. Um, so this is not a static picture, everyone. Um, these people commit offences, these uh, individuals with sexual criminals, these violent criminals commit offences uh, previous to Operation Advance back in 2004. Uh, and interestingly, 28 of them went on to commit further uh, offences, um, you know, before they were convicted of the Operation Advance effect, uh, offence, pardon me. So that's 28 offences, 28 victims um, who might not have been victimised had we done this quicker. Um, and they were all uh, convicted. And this is just part of, of, of Carl's work, my, my friend and, and co-worker. Um, you can see on the, on the, uh, the x-axis, we've got that um, um, evolution of techniques, uh, forensic techniques. Um, the advance, um, Offence was back in 1990, uh, when of course we were very much at the, the early days of DNA, uh, we still had the, the SLP um, techniques in those days. Uh, and I'm just gonna now superimpose these uh, offences uh, over the top of this. So remember our database, our DNA database in the UK went live in 1995. Um, and at the time of that um, database going live, um, there was supposed to be a, a back record conversion. So the, the, the legislation was retrospective. So anyone who'd been convicted previously um, could be visited in prison uh, and could have these samples taken. Um, so you can see that between 1996 and 1999, um, that was, was his uh, pattern of offending. Um, so that's within the, the advanced period um, and post advanced. So do you see um, that these people continue to, to offend? So I, I hope I'm making the, the point to, to all of the scientists, to everyone in the audience, uh, that this is about everyone doing their, their best and, and not just about so the science. Similarly with, with Stephen Everton, you can see the, the, the offending pre-advance, um, the advance offense that he matched against. Um, uh, so uh, as you can see there, serious and extremely violent uh, sexual assault against a 14-year-old girl. Um, this was that case, that was that little Pendorf tube um, that was sitting in the lab you know, that could have been destroyed. He matched against that. Um, what had he done since then? Um, though that was his offending. One gunpoint rape uh, and robbery of a, a, a sex worker. Um, yeah, so you can just see that um, whilst in prison, he admitted further offences um, of robbery, but but not the the rape. Uh, and back in two thousand and three, prior to, just that year, prior to advance, uh, he uh, committed another offence of threatening to kill someone. So I hope you're getting a picture that these people are, uh, you know, they, they don't desist; um, they continue to offend, um, really, until late adulthood. Um, I'm guessing that some of you might have heard of the, the, the Jimmy, Jimmy Savile um, uh, scandal in, in the UK. Uh, Jimmy Savile, the, the uh, I suppose infamous now um, disc jockey, uh, celebrity minor, uh, TV celebrity, who committed offences right the way into late adulthood. So these people do not stop. So this, guys, is for, for all, for everyone in the, in the audience, but particularly for the, the, the scientists who, who do these examinations day in day out um, and often don't get the, the thanks that the credit that they, they deserve. Um, certainly one of the first things I did when, when this had taken off um, was to actually go around personally all the laboratories um, and to, to speak to all the scientists at lunchtime and to say thank you to them. Um, thank you for, for what they've done. So these are just some of the, uh, the remarks that came out of the trial. Uh, again, I'm not going to read these, but um, you can see what the, uh, the judge uh, said some very um, yeah some very strong victims. Um, this, these are not offences that um, you know heal with time, um, and 
particularly if people don't have their offender brought to justice, they, they just it, it just eats away at them. So you can see the um, some of the trial remarks. There were a number of cases where the police service told us that um, when these people had been arrested, um, they'd been following the uh, the advances in science. And one guy had got a scrapbook um, on science DNA advances, um, and um, was effectively it, this must have been playing on his mind because he knew at some point uh, the, the police service were going to come and knock on his door. Um, and I think that taking you know, the, the fear from the victim and actually placing it back on the offender, I think that's a, a, a good thing for us all to do. So that's the, um, the, the one of the take-home messages. Um, no case is ever closed. Um, and the, if, if anyone ever comes to you with this notion of, about, um, you know, victims uh, have moved on, uh, that was not our experience. Um, they do want their day in court. Uh, the lady I told you who was the, the young university student in those days, um, she came over, she came back to the UK um, and um, had a day in court. She was actually in court when this guy was, uh, um, was appearing. So it's a great relief to know that the man who attacked me nearly 14 years ago had been brought to justice. Um, not only is it a great relief for, for that victim, um, but as you can see with their, their continuing patterns of offending, um, it also makes life safer for, uh, for for everyone else as well. So what did we learn from this? Um, there's massive benefits of looking back as well as forward. Um, again, you can, we, we all have, we all know um, how DNA science has advanced. And for each advance in science, um, that gives another opportunity. So even though police services are... Um, are stretched often. Um, there is real, real benefit in looking backwards as well as forwards. Um, one of the things that was um, not so good um, were that the policing archiving procedures, uh, where police had, had not archived their materials as perhaps as well as they might have. Um, so, uh, what double jeopardy means in in our parlance nowadays is that a person can actually be tried twice for that same crime. Um, so, if new technology comes along uh, and the person has already been found not guilty, uh, they can be retried. So we, we learned a, an awful lot along the way. Um, and it is, I mean, there's a lot of talk about closure, never quite sure what we mean necessarily by closure, uh, but it does give a strong public reassurance message. Um, it, it really sings the praises, I think, for, for what the for, for what the scientists do uh, and for what the police service do. Um, and it sends out a very powerful message. And in fact, in our experience, the, some of the, the messages that were, were about these cold cases all, almost seemed more newsworthy um, than the current cases. Um, so we, we did link this with, with publicity. I even wanted to run adverts in, um, in, in men's magazines. Uh, I actually wanted to run some, some articles on this to, to actually put the, the fear back onto these, these perpetrators. Um, so what else do we do? We, we prevent crime. Uh, hopefully you can see how we do that by um, making these samples uh, loadable to the database. Even if they don't match straight away, um, I call them tickets for the future, um, where I'm going back to our guy who was urinating on the uh, um, yeah, at Christmas or the guy who was smoking on, on Birmingham railway station, um, they, 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 you know, they, they match at, at some point. It's a lot cheaper to, to do this. Um, so you saw the comparison with, with previously, you know, the 30, 40,000 um, pounds to resurrect these. Um, a lot, lot cheaper than, than doing that. The science is often the, the cheapest thing to do. Uh, and many of, of the offenders pleaded guilty straight away. Um, so again, not only is there a cost saving in that, uh, but also it, it stops people being, you know, it stops victims having to relive this in, in court. So this is, in our experience, what, what um, how we would look at this. Um, we would look at each scientific advance, scientific advance um, see what the procedure is to, uh, that could be done. Um, we would always want to work with the lawyers because there's no point at all in 
speaking with um, with victims, raising their their hopes to say, you know, you remember this case back in whenever, um, and then a few days afterwards, say, really, really sorry, but you know, the, the lawyers won't take this case forward. So we all need to work together to say, look, you know, if we get, if we can do the science, will you do the prosecution? So we'll undertake that review. Uh, we would follow these uh, this guidance that I hope you can see. I'm, I'm holding up now. We then rework the evidence. Uh, and progress the, uh, the the case to to outcome. Um, we went on to do a number of other things. Um, we looked at prolific unknowns. What do, what do I mean by prolific unknowns? Um, these were cases where the crime sample um, we, they, they weren't crime samples per se. Um, they, they weren't they weren't linked to an offender. That's what I was meaning to say. Um, these were cases where. We didn't actually know who the person was, the perpetrator was, but there were a series of cases that were, were linked together. Operation Enigma was a, a, a type of thing that we were trying to look at with, um, with uh, fingerprints, uh, and we started to look at the homicide cold case reviews. So the, the take home messages are these, um, that old offence, because this case is 15, 20 years old, um, that does not equal old offending. Um, we can't afford, afford not to act. Um, and for these victims, as I say in the uh, final bullet there, justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, and so that's not my, my email address anymore, um, but if you have a pen and paper handy, my email address nowadays is r.green at kent.ac.uk. I'll just repeat that again, r.green at kent.ac.uk. Uh, and I'm happy to follow up on anything with the, uh, with anyone. Because although this was it was in the UK, um, this, trans this translates to any country in the world. Um, if we could do this based on a, on a, on a, a conversation in, in a pub one night, um, what can uh, what can you do? So that's, that's everything I have um, uh, Ranjit, I'll stop sharing now, um, and hopefully that was of some interest. I can now see the uh, uh, the chat. Thank you uh, to Dr. Robert Green for delivering a wonderful talk on serious crime investigation. And uh, I will request other participants also, if they have the questions, they can ask the question. They can type the question in chat box. We will try to take maximum questions. Bob, I also request if you, uh, can you read the question in the chat or should I read for you? Uh, I can I can see some of them. Um, I'll, I'll go from the bottom upwards actually. In, in your opinion, how does the university uh, can contribute to um, unlocking cold cases? Um, well, I, I think by, by getting together the, the criminologists um, and the forensic scientists, I think that would be one, uh, one good way to, to uh, um, bridge that gap. Criminologists, lawyers, um, and scientists working together. Uh, because very often, as I've said, the, the easy part is to actually get the, the science to work. Um, the hard part is getting all of this, um, all of this other stuff to, to work. So that, that's one way I think we, we could do that. Uh, depending on, on your country and where you are, um, you know, where you are. Um, I, I suppose that the universities could um, look, look at, you know, look at developing the science to make it more and more sensitive to continue to develop the multiplexes. Um, let's have a look. How does it, how long does it take a case to be classified as cold? Uh, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm really not sure of that. Um, I, I don't think there's any, um, any defined time, I suppose it's when the police stop actively uh, investigating this. Um, in our country, there's generally a period of intense activity, and depending on what the crime is, um, by the end of that one year or something like that, the case is, you know, the, the investigative leads dry up um, and there's nothing more that can be, can be done. Um, I am doing well, thank you, um, Sanjita, in the pandemic. Um, could you please say more about um, SGM Plus? Um, no, it, it's not. Um, a, it, it's CODIS. Um, it, it's not about. It's not about that. It's. It was our um, multiplex. It was a multiplex that we started with when the database went went live back in uh, in nineteen ninety five. 
we start, we were thinking that we would start with what we refer to as a fourplex. It was, it was that was that quad system, um, uh, and it, it looked at, at four um, four areas, four areas on the um, DNA strand. We very quickly learned that four was not going to be anywhere enough, um, so we went with a multiplex called um, second generation multiplex which targeted six sites, uh, six areas of, of DNA. Um, and of course, with six areas, uh, we, we would have 12 options. We would have six uh, markers from mum and six from dad. So we had that multiplex to start with. Um, so we, we had uh, SGM with was six, uh, which gave us 12 numbers. Then we, refer, we very quickly learned that we were getting uh, what we refer to as advantageous matches. So matches that were just happening just by, by chance. Uh, so with, with 12 markers, there weren't enough markers to make it as discriminating as we needed. So we went to, to DNA, um, so we, we, we went to SGM Plus, which was a templex. So that had looked at, at 10 sites, 10 sites equals 20 markers, um, and they give, give, give us more discriminating power. And that moved on until um, a, a few years ago now, uh, Two or three years ago, where we moved, we moved to DNA 17, where we now look at 17 sites, uh, giving us 30, um, 34 possible markers. And, and I think in, in some countries, uh, I've heard of DNA uh, multiplexes of around 20, 24 uh, sites. Uh, in Scotland, in the UK, we have DNA 21, uh, which has 21 looks at 21 sites. So hopefully, um, that's answered your. Uh, your, your question, Sanjita, but, but if, if not, email me. Uh, as I said, my, my email address is r.green at kent.ac.uk. Um, I think that was all of the... Um, Sir, what is the procedure for offline internship? Um, I'm not entirely sure I can answer that at the moment. I think in, in certainly in, in in Kent terms, you know, we, we're struggling really to, to get through this this current pandemic, so um, certainly keep keep in touch with that. Um, yep. So, sir, well, uh, we have uh, Deepa Madhu. She wants to ask something. Madam, uh, you can ask your question. Hi, doctor. It was an amazing lecture. I'm Deepa. I'm currently in Stockport, Greater Manchester. Oh, wow. Hello. Hi, Deepa. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, um, I studied criminology in Swansea with Dr. Peter Reiner. So, my question is, you are a kind of pioneer in the practical field, then you move to academia. So how, how was the transition? How, which, which area you prefer the most, whether in the practical field or in the academia? That is my question. Well, it, it, it started by, by accident, uh, Deepa. It, it started really by um, me going to the Forensic Science Service. Um, and so my, my, my path into academia um, was me um, being on, on a course, uh, an academic course, when I joined the Forensic Science Service um, and they offered me to, to do some further master's study. Uh, and whilst I was on that course, um, I bumped into a colleague uh, who was at the time working at the University of Kent, um, who said, you know, we're, we're starting a forensic science program there. Um, can you come and advise? Can you help teach on it for us? So I, I, I did that for a number of years, uh, part-time. So I uh, taught for, for one semester, uh, condensed and I always thought you know I, it was part-time uh, so that's really how I started in, in, in the field um, and it, it stayed like that really until I, I left the home office um, and I, I suppose I retired um, if you can call it that um, and spent about two weeks literally kicking my heels and thought no I've got to do something else so I went into academia full-time so initially, I got a job at the University of Greenwich uh, and then went back to Kent full time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Baba Sidhu, you want to ask? You can ask your question. Yes. Um, thank you, Doc, for that wonderful presentation. Um, thank you, Baba. You, you made mention of um, one of the offenders being given um, one to two years in a life sentence. I want to know what a non-life sentence means. Okay, a, a non-life sentence is uh, any any sentence that is not one of life imprisonment. 
Um, so for, for us, for example, for, for, for murder, um, the, the only mandatory sentence uh, is one of life imprisonment. That doesn't necessarily mean in our country that life means life, uh, but it was all of the, the other offences, all of the, the offences that weren't dealt with by, by life. Um, they, they were given, deter we were, they referred to as determinate sentences. So if a person was given 13 years or 15 years, um, that was that, that's the reason we, we, we separated those out. And the reason for doing that, Baba, is because we couldn't, uh, if you're given a life sentence, it's for the parole board to decide when you will be released. So that's why we actually couldn't um, uh, say what actual uh, length of sentence was on that case. I, I hope that's um, helped. Yeah, Kartika. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, before I want to ask my question, I would like to ex uh, share my gratitude to Robert, sir, for uh, sharing such interesting talk on a very uh, challenging and a very amazing topic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, with this, my question is quite easy, but I really want to get an idea that uh, how much time must pass before a case is listed as a cold case? Well, I, I think I, I tried to start to answer that earlier on um the i don't think there's a, a defined um time limit uh, i i think it's probably when the the investigative leads the, the police leads on a case dry up so you you'll know that in in, in any crime inquiry there are lots of um, often lots of investigative leads that arise straight away and then after time you know the the, the clues um dry up um, and once the, the police stop actively investigating those cases, uh, for example, in, in the UK, a murder, depending on what it is, um, would probably go cold after about a year. Um, but I don't think there's a, a particular definitive time. Um, so it's, it's anything and it's anything, uh, critique, any, any time you're in the lab uh, and you, uh, you, you know, you've come up with, with some new clues. Um, then you know let, let's go get those back you know release back to the police service. So I'm not sure I've answered you correctly there, but uh, um, that's my, uh, my my take on it. No, uh, no, I really appreciate, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the information. Thank you, thank you, Ranjit, sir, for giving me opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah. So there is two common questions from all the participants. That is a one they uh, want some PDF, which is said by you. Uh, yeah. So once you will send PDF to me, we will send this PDF. Sure. We upload this PDF on our page. You have to just visit the page of this event, Serious Crime Investigation, and in the download section, you can find that PDF so that uh, you can download PDF. The second question I'm getting uh, personal message also and uh, in group also, how to download the certificate. So for certificate download, uh, we will not send the certificate on the email. You can directly download from the website, and for that, this is the link. And by this link, you all can download the certificate. And uh, third, I think we have covered all the questions. And uh, as far as this presentation recording is concerned, we will upload on our YouTube channel uh, by getting a consent from uh, Dr. Robert. So once he will give the consent, we'll upload this website on our YouTube channel and share the link We'll up, uh, put this link also on our page. Okay, sure. So thank you so much, Bob. I think we have taken all the questions. Still, if anyone have questions, you can raise your hand. I think we have covered all the questions. There is one question from the Ray Raymond. I just want to read for you because he sent direct message to me. Uh, Dr. Green, for that wonderful presentation, my question, when you are giving the background of those who committed crime, I saw that some were already serving sentences how then they were able to commit other crime? Well, because sometimes the, 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 the offending pattern is very fluid. Um, so you, you saw with the, the timeline of some of those individuals um, that, you know, we, we, they, they weren't identified for the crime um, when, they, when they should have been. So if they had been, if we'd have known about it at the time, they would have been sentenced for that crime as well. So it was. It's just all to do with where, you know, where, where the advances in science arise in in that pattern of that that, in that, that continuum of offending. Um, so if they, you know, if the advances haven't come prior to the the offender being convicted and sentenced, um, they would be. They may have been incarcerated for some other crimes. Yeah. 
Um, yes. So I think uh, we have taken all the questions. There is another question. Is it possible to invest, investigate cold cases on financial crime and fraud? Uh, yes, it is because, of course, you know, those, those similar techniques. I mean, I've, I've used DNA, um, but you, you saw that we, we, we did the same again with, uh, with we were looking at fingerprints. Uh, because you know we, we'd had um, some advances in fingerprints, where you know the, the, the newer database, the new um, um, technologies, uh, new databases had palm prints also. So could we go back to some of these cases where we you know we didn't have good fingerprints, but we had we had palm. So could we go back to, to those? Could we do financial crime? Yes, we could, um, because there will be. I mean, I'm not a financial expert, but um, there will have been advances in the uh, discovery and uh, investigation of financial crime. In the same way that uh, we, we saw with DNA, where you can actually look back as well as as well as forward. So the last question, and that question also asked by the many students in my personal message: What will be your advice for forensic sciences today? Um, what would my advice? Um, I, I think what I've experienced over the years um, is that forensic science really needs to. Uh, to bang its own drum a little bit more. Um, there are lots of things that, that you people do um, daily in the laboratory um, that never get released to, uh, to the public. Uh, forensic science and forensic scientists of the future, um, I think need to be a little bit more pushy in terms of saying, actually, you know, that was a, uh, yes, it was a good investigation, uh, but you know what? Uh, the real clue in that case uh, was me pressing the pipette on my plunger, the plunger on my pipette, pardon me, um, and uh, um, yeah, just 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 bang your drum a little bit more, um, because you, you if you don't, then you know we don't get the the, the, the investment, um, and um, and and it's it's such, just such a powerful story that you've all got to tell. So with this, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. For more updates, you can follow our Instagram account.